Okay, so now a little bit easier stuff. So we have these two environmental axes and we have the species fundamental niche, which is what we would love to be able to model. If our study region <coughs> encompasses uh, all of those conditions and more, we have a pretty good chance uh, of being able to recognize uh, and delimit the species fundamental niche. But what if this red circle indicates the environmental conditions present in our study region? Can we, uh, will we have positive records over here to show us that this part of the environmental space is suitable? No, we have no way to do that, right? So, um, in the terminology of Jackson Overpack, this is a potential niche. In um, the, techno or the terminology that I'm going to use, it's what we call the existing fundamental niche, the part of the fundamental niche that exists in our study region. Okay? So, we, we don't have the possibility of reconstructing or characterizing the species' full fundamental niche in this situation. What we need to do is see if we can detect this boundary. So here, on this side, we can see, okay, we have records all the way up to here, and even though the environment continues in our study region, we don't have records. Okay, so we seem to see uh, a boundary there of what is occupied compared to what's available, right? This is a different kind of boundary. Over here, we're probably gonna have positive records all the way up to the edge of this red circle, okay? But then we don't have anything, or we don't have any areas that, that extend farther into those conditions. So if we see that kind of uh, a situation, then that should ring a bell for us and say, oops, we have to be really, really careful because the species might be able to uh, occupy conditions that are uh, a little bit more extreme in environmental space, but, but we don't have those because they just don't exist anywhere here, okay? So for example, you do have a species here on San Miguel, and it occupies you know, all of the, say, the wettest areas, right? I mean, everything's pretty wet, right? <laughs> okay? Um, but what if, yeah, and so what if you, know, you, you have it, actually everywhere on San Miguel, right? So you would have a situation and you really wouldn't know anything about its requirements because it occupies everything possible. Imagine it occupied like only the wetter half, right? Um, but what if you had an island next door that was even wetter? You know, would the species be able to be present there or not? Well, we don't really, really know from our observational data and a correlative approach will not tell us that for sure. Okay, so when you have this situation of occupying all of the conditions available and you not being able to see uh, what would happen in more extreme conditions, does anybody know the term in the literature that people use for this? <laughs> if you, yeah, imagine if you have, just because I think some of you will have heard of this, if you have just one environmental variable and you're trying to model the species response to that variable, but then you, in, you, you run out of environmental condition, that's all you have, and then you don't have these other more extreme environmental conditions, any ideas? Okay. That's what many people will call a truncated response. I do. <laughs> I knew you heard what that was, right? So this, we have our species response, but it's truncated by the availability of what's there. Okay? And we will look at that quite a bit, because that's really critical for transfers. Okay, so more theory. So there are different ways to study niches, but there's also different perspectives about the niche itself. And the niche has a very long history with lots of people thinking about it. And there's two fundamental different perspectives that will be helpful and useful for us. And one is a perspective that can be called the Eltonian niche. So this is defined by what are called linked variables. So these are variables um, whose value is modified by the presence of the species. 
So our species can affect that other variable. Um, these are generally uh, measured on a fine grain and, and relevant at fine local scales. And these are modeling, well, let's first say, what, when you think about tone images, or what kind of variable actually might be affected by the species itself? Ideas? Present relationship. Yeah, that is classic, okay? So, and I didn't like give him all the answers either, right? <laughs> um, that's a classic example of these feedbacks. There are linked population levels between different species, for example. Now, these kind of linked variables don't have to be biotic, but generally people have considered that biotic interactions are Eltonian processes. And we're kind of pushing, the field is pushing in the direction of considering other possibilities, but, but, but certainly most biotic interactions um, are very likely to be Eltonian. And what's important about this is the, the math necessary for studying Eltonian niches with linked variables um, can model density dependent factors and it requires things that are pretty complex that are called resource impact vectors, for example. And it's a kind of math that I'm not very interested in getting into, okay? Um, this, this stuff is really complicated, okay? Um, but it has been summarized, um, for example, in a book by Jason Leibel, um, you know, over a decade ago at this point. And that math exists. Um, and this is important for understanding um, species niches for sure, right? Especially at fine local scales. However, there's another perspective on the niche, uh, which is complementary and I think also necessary for under having a holistic understanding of the species niche. And that can be called the Bernoullian niche. Um, and it's defined by unlinked variables, okay? Um, so these are variables that are not modified by the presence of the species, okay? Um, and they have been termed synopoetic, and this term uh, was actually introduced by Hutchinson. Um, and it comes from Greek roots that mean for setting the stage. I think that's really, really appropriate. So this is starting out, and this is like where we're going to start from. Okay, and then we can get more complex models considering Eltonian processes on top of that. These are generally relevant at a coarser grain and generally things that we measure at a coarser grain. And these only were, when we model this, we only can model density independent processes because they're unlinked. Okay? Um, and, but that is fantastic because it means we can use much simpler math. So if you say, okay, for my question, um, it is relevant to study uh, coarser grain uh, information with unlinked variables, then you get to use simpler math, right? Simpler math like history regression trees, and max ends, and gams and glims, right? It's simple math, right? <laughs> so the other stuff is even harder. So just be happy. And this, uh, it's something, uh, uh, this is the perspective of the niche that was synthesized uh, fairly recently in a book project by many uh, authors, uh, and Tam Peterson was the first author, and I also participated in that project. And that, this is the kind of niche model that we're going to be working on in this class. And this is a picture of the book, um, which is over four years of sweat, blood, and tears uh, by seven people. So we hope that it's useful, <laughs> um, and uh, I hope it's something where we have established some concepts that will continue to be valid into the future, and um, obviously there are many, many things uh, that are advancing in the field, but we hope that there are contributions here uh, that will kind of set the stage uh, theoretically. Okay? So what about Hutchinson, right? Isn't he Mr. Niche, right? We haven't forgotten about Hutchinson. Um, so he talked about fundamental niches and what other kind of niches? Well, that's kind of more like the fundamental. Realized, okay? So there are other reduced niche spaces that can be inspired or that were inspired by his fundamental and realized. And so this is uh, within the here, what I'm talking is within the context of Grinnellian niches. 
So within the Grinnellian framework, we can have um, fundamental and realized niches and other kinds of niches. And why? Well, because like we said before, the species occupied distribution typically is smaller than the areas that are abiotically suitable for it. Okay, so why is this? So three classes of factors. First are what I'll call contingent factors. Um, contingent uh, accidents of history. So lack of dispersal or local extinction. Okay. Second, our good friend biotic interactions, all kinds of interactions, but people have thought about this probably most with competition. And then a very special case of a biotic interaction of one species uh, introduced around the world by itself and has had a huge impact upon other species. Okay? So, but I think the effect of humans is so pervasive and so important that it helps us to think about ourselves a little differently. Um, because if you're thinking about biotic interactions, you're often thinking very abstractly in competition in this, but, um, but human impacts, we generally um, are using different kinds of data to try to quantify them, from what we sense data, vegetation, surrogates, and things like that. So these are the three classes of factors that explain why a species may not occupy some area that actually uh, should be suitable for it. Okay, questions so far? Okay, I'm going to go over something that Town will also cover in his video, so I will um, just give you a little bit about this and then he will talk much more. So this is a way of conceptualizing um, the relative importance of those three classes of factors, and right now we're gonna actually consider humans within the biotic circle, okay? So if, the box is our study region, then some subset of that is um, some set of those geographic spaces are suitable from the abiotic perspective. Those are the areas in green. And those are what we call the abiotically suitable areas. This is what happens when you put seven people together and you try to pick a term that everybody agrees on. It's like, it like tastes just about as exciting as you know, rice and water. <laughs> um, but, but, it's like, but it's exactly what we need. Areas that are abiotically suitable, based on our cinematic variables. So there's other areas that are biotically suitable, and hopefully they overlap, because if they don't overlap, the species has no hope. Um, the overlap between the areas that are abiotically suitable and biotically suitable is what, in the book, we decided to call the potential distributional area. This is a little different than that term that's been used in the past, but, but it's very clearly defined like that for the books, so we're going to use right now. And then the species can't necessarily get everywhere, uh, but these are the areas that, based on its movement, its dispersal ability, it can get to. So, of everywhere in our box, where is the species actually going to be found? The intersection of all three of those, okay? Which has the really exciting name of the occupied distributional area, okay? Um, so, there's two ways you can use the, the BAM diagram. B A M is what this is, we call it. It began with Sobodon and Peterson a long, long time ago, and then there have been some, you know, uh, refinements. But, the one way you can use this is think, okay, very generally, very conceptually, just like a Venn diagram, so there are abiotic factors and biotic factors and movement-related factors, and they all have to be favorable, okay? And it's useful like that, okay? The other way is a, a more literal uh, understanding of this as being my area in geographic space but rearranged. So this is also can be thought of geographic space uh, where you have your grid and you shatter it, you break it into pixels, all these little pixels, and then you move them around so that they make nice little circles. And you think about how much those different circles overlap. So it's very, if you're gonna do that, it's very, very important to make sure you're thinking about 
geographic space, not environmental space. People get confused with that uh, for this. But geographic space rearranged so that pixels with similar um, conditions, similar, similar drivers are, are put together. So um, you can think about that more in time. Think about that more. We can go through things in the discussion period if you want. Okay. And then the part of the potential distribution that's not occupied, so totally suitable by the abiotic side, totally suitable by the biotic side, but it hasn't uh, been able to get there, right? That portion of it at the top is what we call the invadable distributional area. Okay, so if it got there, it would be happy. What we really want to do, our real goal is to model the uh, green circle, the A circle. So when we think later, not in geographic space, but in environmental space, we're going to think back to those um, plots by Pulliam and say, okay, if we don't have perfect representation, to what degree are our data biased with regard uh, to environmental space uh, or not? Because if, if we do have those situations where, for example, a competitor is removing a species from some portion of the environmental space, then we're not going to be able to reconstruct our A circle the way we want to. But that's our goal. We're trying to uh, model the abiotically suitable conditions and then to identify the abiotically suitable areas um, either now or in another place or in another time period. And so in this modeling the abiotic conditions, we're really more looking at the deterministic side of the niche, its uh, inherited physiology. And whereas these other circles have much more to do about accidents of history, contingent uh, things that have happened along phylogeny and where the species uh, originated, where it's been able to disperse or not. And also, that enters into the biotic uh, circle of, well, the species it's interacting or it can interact with, you know, where did they, uh, uh, where did they evolve? And where have they been able to move to? Okay. Now, so I promise we're gonna have a little bit more about Hutchinson. So Hutchinson talked very clearly about the fundamental niche. He also talked very clearly about the realized niche. And we're gonna kind of break that down a little bit. So the, we already talked about the existing fundamental niche uh, because we may not be able to see the full fundamental niche in our study region. Um, biotically reduced niche um, is the niche space, an environmental space, that the species actually can inhabit considering all of the uh, biotic interactors that are present in that study region. So if we were just going to consider competition, this would be the same as what for Hutchinson? About the well, the realized niche. Okay? But we would say, well, competition is not the only important biotic interaction. Uh, so let's consider all of those together. Okay? We already saw that the occupied distributional area can be smaller than the potential distributional area. So the niche space that corresponds to the areas that the species actually occupies only occupied niche space, and then the environmental conditions in the in, uh, areas that are potentially suitable but not occupied because it hasn't dispersed there, we can call the invadable niche space. Okay, so some terms to think about, and there's a nice table in the book and actually in uh, a later, uh, later paper of mine that we produced that. Okay, so you don't even have to buy the book to get the table. Now, just one, and this is basically the table here, thinking about geographic and um, environmental spaces. So um, we have the, the four kinds of areas in geography, and then the corresponding niche spaces. Remember, we would like to model the fundamental niche, but we know the best we possibly can do is the existing fundamental niche, or our study region. And we may actually um, have subsets within that. But one thing that's really, really important is the only one of these that you can go back and forth using a GIS 
is between the abiotically suitable area and the existing fundamental niche. You can you know, extract uh, from, from your map. If you knew what the abiotically suitable area was, you know, if, if Wallace talked to you tonight in, in your dream and he told you what was suitable, you could extract those conditions and, um, and then plot them in environmental space. He also told you what variables were important and you could show the existing fundamental niche. Okay? If, you, if somebody told you, maybe from a neck mechanistic experiment, these are the environmental conditions that the species can inhabit, and you know which part of that is found in your study region, you can use any GIS to take that, apply it to geography, and show you the abiotic suitable area. You can go both directions there. You can't do that for any of the others. So, for example, if you have a potential distributional area, um, you can extract the environmental information and characterize the biologically reduced niche space, right? But if you have the niche space that's suitable after you consider these biotic interactions, you can't take that and project it onto geography to identify the potential distributional area. So why is that? It's because you don't know enough about the distribution of other of the other drivers. You can't take that and project it back onto the geography because you don't know, if you just know the environmental conditions that are suitable after those interactions, you don't know the distribution of those interactors themselves, of those other species, for example. Um, if you think about this one, right? And you forget about body interactions, it's also kind of, it's maybe a little easier. So the areas that the species inhabit, or the, the conditions the species inhabits, right? You take that and you project it over here. Imagine you would have a blob over here and a blob over there. Well, you don't have enough information, you don't have any information about where the species exists and where it's able to disperse to or what it's not been able to disperse to. Right? So if you know this, you can extract the environment, environmental information and um, characterize this, but if you know that, you can't go this direction and identify that. Only at the very top. Suitable areas and suitable areas and suitable conditions. Right? Um, so that means that whenever, in order to transfer, we want to do these kind of transfers, right? And in order to do that, we need a model of the existing fundamental niche in order to go that, that direction to identify the abiotically suitable area in another time period or in another place. Okay? And that will that will lead us to some more realistic things later. So you may want to know later something other than the abiotically suitable area. How many of you are thinking of future climate change? Okay, what is it that you actually want to know? At the end of the day, the end of the project, what do you actually want to know? Um, is the species going to be extinct? Okay. Um, what other areas is it going to occupy? Yes, occupy, right? So you don't want to know simply what will be suitable for it. You want to know eventually what it's going to occupy, right? In order to get there, you need to start with this, project to that, and then consider other information in order to figure out of the areas that will be suitable, what will, what subset will really be occupied. Okay? So we're going to talk tomorrow about linking to spatially explicit models um, that people have developed uh, in order to do so. <clears throat> but in order to do that transfer, we have to have models that are free of those kinds of realities, okay? We don't want models of these because we can't project them in that direction. We want this kind of model that we can project in that kind of direction, free, as free as possible of these other kinds of complications, and then we'll take into account those kinds of spatial explicit um, restrictions with regard to dispersal and, and by interactions. 
So, I wanted to thank uh, you guys, but also the National Science Foundation and funding at CUNY. And um, I think that we will see where we are on time and decide if we're going to do questions now or after the video. All right, thanks a lot.